is a holy mess. Last week, we considered the holy mess that is our world, our need to repent, a world that indeed God loves enough to enter into and redeem. This week, we turn our attention to the holy mess of family through the genealogy of Jesus, as found at the beginning of Matthew's gospel. Starting at verse 1, together, let us listen for God's word to us this day. An account of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. <laughs> Abraham. There's an interesting character. I, I just need to pause a moment on him, if that's okay with you. History remembers him pretty favorably. We heard of him in the Genesis 17 reading. We remember his, his great faith that led him to pack up everything he owned and head west to a land that God would show him when he was 75 years old. He, he trusted the promise, Scripture says, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. He is the paterfamilias of three major world religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. We got a, a great vacation Bible school song about him. Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them, and so are you. So let's all praise the Lord. Right hand. Remember that one? Yeah. He did have many sons. He had at least eight, according to Genesis 25, by three different women. His firstborn son was Ishmael. His mother was Sarah's maid. Hagar, I'm not sure who thought that was a good idea. It proved disastrous as Sarah demanded that Hagar and her son be put out into the desert to die. And Abraham actually did it. Do you remember that story? And that's, that's only one of the questionable things Abraham did in his life. He, he pawned his wife Sarah off as his sister to save his own skin, not once, but twice. What kind of man does that? Well, I'm sorry, back to the genealogy. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Yes, yes, he was. I got to stop again here. Uh, who could forget the moment when Abraham almost sacrificed Isaac because God told him to? I wonder how exactly he heard God tell him to do that. I'm sure DHS would accept that if a father's found holding a knife over his bound child. What a horrific story in Genesis. You know, Isaac never spoke with Abraham again after that. Would you? And Isaac, he, he never really amounted to much. Perhaps it's hard to live up to a dad with a reputation like Abraham. Isaac's name means laughter. Scripture says that's because Sarah laughed when she found out she was going to have a baby at 90 years old. But reading the story, you could conclude that Isaac was basically a joke. Some rabbis over the century come to that conclusion. Uh, I'm sorry, back to the genealogy. And Isaac, the father of Jacob, <laughs> Jacob, I, I got to stop here again. I mean, Jacob was a true piece of work. His name tips you off to that. It means trickster. Yep, that's what he was. He, he came out of the womb trying to grip onto his brother Esau's heel to hold him back so he could be first. He stole Esau's birthright, stole his blessing, connived his way through the world. And yet, God couldn't give up on him. God even wrestled with him through the night. Do you remember that story? And Jacob survived a wrestling match with God, came away limping, and his name was changed to Israel. And his sons would become the 12 tribes of Israel. Hmm. Back to the genealogy, Jacob was the father of Judah and his brothers, and we remember them too. Talk about sibling rivalries. You remember how they sold their brother Joseph into slavery in Egypt? They faked his death so that they wouldn't get in trouble with their dad? 
And that was all Judah's idea. They, they truly are sons of Jacob, the trickster. The apple does not fall far from the tree, I guess. The genealogy continues. Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Tamar. I, I promise I won't do this with every one of these names. We'd be here all afternoon. But this is just too good to pass up. Do you remember the story about Judah and Tamar? I'm pretty sure Matthew wants us to remember it because he puts Tamar, a woman, in the genealogy, which just was not done back in that day. He wants us to remember Tamar and to remember who she was. She was, in fact, Judah's daughter-in-law. Talk about a scandal. It's all there in Genesis 38. I can't give you the details because honestly, it's too crass to have in a sermon, but it's in the Bible. What a mess. Well, let's keep going with this genealogy. We've got to beat the Methodist and the Baptist to brunch, and we've got communion today. So Perez was the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Aram, Aram the father of Aminadab, Aminadab the father of Nashon. Nashon's a fascinating character. Lots of great stories about him, but we can't stop there. Nashon, the father of Salmon, and Salmon, the father of Boaz by Rahab. Hmm. Rahab. Second woman in the genealogy. Does her name ring a bell? She was that brave woman in Joshua 2 who hid the spies from the king of Jericho. The spies, were told, went there to spend the night with her. Remember her line of work? Another thing I probably shouldn't talk about in a sermon, hers was the oldest profession in the world, as the saying goes. There she is, Rahab, a prostitute in Jesus' family tree. I'd forgotten that she and Salmon were the parents of Boaz. And Boaz, the genealogy says, was the father of Obed by Ruth, the third woman mentioned in the genealogy. Hers is an amazing story, too. Do you remember it? Another foreign woman, she's a, she's a Moabite. And according to Deuteronomy 23, Moabites were banned from entering the temple to the 10th generation. What is she doing in a Jewish genealogy? You remember her story? She was widowed. And then she followed her mother-in-law, Naomi, back to Judah. And in gleaning the leftovers, she meets Boaz, who just so happens to be a distant relative of her deceased husband. And after some adept footwork is mentioned, she and Boaz marry, and they have Obed, which brings us back to the genealogy. Obed, the father of Jesse. Jesse, the father of King David. <laughs> King David. Whew. What a mess. He's got so much going on in his life, we did a six-week sermon series on David. Some say he was an amazing man of faith. He indeed defeated the giant Goliath. He brought glory to Israel on the battlefield. He established Jerusalem as the city of God. And to top it off, he was quite a musician. The scholar Samuel Terrian writes, the purity of David's faith assumed a quality of elegance which has often gone unnoticed in modern times. <laughs> of course, another scholar, John McKinsey, describes David as, quote, a bloodthirsty, oversexed bandit. He had at least 19 sons by at least seven wives and 10 concubines. Not exactly a paragon of virtue. The rock-bottom moment of his immorality was that whole incident with Bathsheba, which Matthew wants to be sure we don't forget by the way he describes the birth of Solomon as the genealogy continues, and David was the father of Solomon by the wife 
of Uriah. The wife of Uriah. The fourth woman mentioned in the genealogy. Matthew doesn't exactly name Bathsheba, but we all know who she was. He names who she was originally married to, pointing out the messiness of all this. Yeah, that David, he was a piece of work. So which was it? Was he a man whose purity of faith assumed an unnoticed quality of elegance? Or was he an oversexed bandit? Could the answer possibly be yes? It's messy. Back to the genealogy. Solomon, the father of Rehoboam, <laughs> that Solomon, he was a mixed bag too. The VBS version of him is not so bad. He built the temple, prayed for wisdom, wrote a bunch of Proverbs, but he also married hundreds of foreign wives and he built temples to foreign gods and he taxed and enslaved his own people like Pharaoh and his leadership ultimately paved the way to Israel dividing into two kingdoms. Was he a good king or a bad king? Again, what if, what if the answer is yes? Family trees are seldom filled with only white hats on some people and black hats on others, good guys and bad guys. It's a lot more complicated than that. That's certainly true in my own family tree. Is it in yours? The genealogy continues through the kings of Judah and Rehoboam, the father of Abijah and Abijah, the father of Asaph and Asaph, the father of Jehoshaphat and Jehoshaphat, the father of Joram and Joram, the father of Uzziah and Uzziah, the father of Jotham and Jotham, the father of Ahaz, not a fan favorite of the prophet Isaiah. Ahaz was the father of Hezekiah, not too bad. And Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh, the worst, and Manasseh, the, the father of Amos, and Amos, the father of Josiah, a good king, not quite good enough. Josiah, the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. Hmm. Matthew leaves out at least three really bad kings, Ahaziah, Jehoash, and Amaziah. In fact, Kings were the reason for Israel's existential crisis we know as the Babylonian exile, what Matthew names the deportation to Babylon. Most of these kings were really bad. So God put them in exile. Hezekiah and Josiah are notable differences. They were good, but again, they were not good enough to get God to relent. I wonder, can we be so declarative about all these kings? Can people really be identified as good or bad? It's, it's got to be more complicated than that, doesn't it? Even, even the worst might have some good in them, and even the best probably have a little bad. That's certainly true in my family. How about yours? Let's finish out this genealogy with characters who don't show up in Scripture at all, at least not until the final couple of names. They are the unknown part of Jesus' family tree, ones who didn't make the paper, or lead any particularly noteworthy lives, names of people whose lives were likely just as complicated as all those whom we know much more about. 
The genealogy continues. And after the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Salathiel, and Salathiel the father of Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel the father of Abiud, and Abiud the father of Eliakim, and Eliakim the father of Azor, and Azor the father of Zadok, and Zadok the father of Achim, and Achim the father of Eliud, and Eliud the father of Eleazar, and Eleazar the father of Mathan, and Mathan the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called the Messiah. Mary, the fifth woman named in the genealogy. She must be named because She's the only means by which Jesus is connected to all this royal mess of a family. Because Joseph was her husband, Jesus is linked to this line. It is a holy mess. Yet, through all these broken people like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob through these gutsy women like Tamar and Rahab and Ruth and Bathsheba through these complicated characters like David and Solomon and and all those broken kings it's through this mess of a family that God works to redeem the world. (laughs) Through them, God claims us, all of us, as God's own children, redeemed in Jesus Christ. Beloved, if God can work that way, through this mess of a family, then maybe, just maybe, God can work through us. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.